Okay, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to Knowledge at Noon. Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies in Washington, D.C. is very honored to present this series uh, for your uh, information and entertainment. Today, we certainly have uh, a distinguished colleague that's joining us, and it's, it's my honor to introduce him. Uh, Dr. John Tribus is the Executive Director and Professor at Georgetown University's Center for Social Impact Communication. Uh, John is charged with directing all of the center's operations, strategy, partnerships, research, and curriculum. Um, also, I'm, I hope he tells you a little bit about, uh, as part of his duties, he has written uh, four really incredible uh, professional certificates in the field of social impact communications. Uh, while John gives his presentation this afternoon, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, type your questions into the chat box. Uh, at the end of John's presentation, we will then uh, be happy to address those questions. Dr. Tribus, can you join us? Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Thank you for the kind introduction, the opportunity to be with you. And hello, everybody. Thank you for taking an hour out of your day to join us today, Knowledge at Noon, and today's presentation, The Evolution of Storytelling for Social Impact. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, in my work at Georgetown, leading the Center for Social Impact Communication, we do have four certificate programs. So there is a wonderful, rich portfolio of so many professional certificate programs that Jeff leads, and I get the opportunity to have created and been a part of four in particular. So certainly social impact storytelling, I see a couple of familiar faces, a couple of alums of that program on the line. So a particular welcome to you, glad to see you. And we also offer programs in uh, certificate in social impact consulting, social impact partnerships, and social impact branding. So beyond today's presentation, if those are of interest to you, I definitely encourage you to check out our website to learn more. You can always also email me for more information. My email is jt452 at georgetown.edu. And as mentioned, I am the director of our Center for Social Impact Communication, and I'm so proud to be uh, the leader of that center. And really, fundamentally, what our work is about is the philosophy that communication is inextricably linked to social change. And everybody must be a communicator in order to facilitate social change. So whatever the actual topic might be, we really fundamentally believe is that we have to communicate. That might be verbally, that might be other forms of communication, but if we're really going to work to solve or at least mitigate really serious social issues facing society, communication has to be part of that process. And what's more is specifically storytelling has to be part of that process. So I'm really thrilled to share a little bit about the work that we're doing on that topic with today's session. So I hope I can tell you a little bit more about the thoughts that we have about how social impact storytelling is evolving. Uh, but because it's storytelling, there's only one proper way to begin talking about this subject, and that's really from a personal perspective. We'll definitely get into professional applications of storytelling today. I hope you have lots of different questions or points of discussion. But I don't know about you, but I fundamentally believe that each of us, we're kind of composed of stories. An interesting way to think about ourselves as human beings, homo sapiens, but some other scientists actually call us homo narratus, meaning narrative, that we can't get through a single day without telling and consuming stories. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of us are the most eloquent of storytellers, uh, but that it's fundamentally linked to what it means to be a human. There was one study that actually uh, postulated that at least 65% of our everyday interactions are based on stories, is that's how we communicate as human beings, as those homo narratus. So I'm composed of so many different stories. I don't have enough time to tell you about all those different stories, but one of my stories is I'm an, obviously an educator. At Georgetown, I get the distinct privilege of teaching a couple of those programs, including the Certificate in Social Impact Storytelling. And I'm kind of an accidental educator, uh, but I think I was bound to be. And what I mean by that is I literally am the perfect combination of my parents. My mother is uh, and was, she's semi-retired, but she's a college professor. 
And so I came from that background. And I also came from my father being a leader of nonprofit organizations. He unfortunately passed a couple of years ago, but he led a number of different nonprofits, including one called Helping Hand that employed and cared for people who were differently abled. And so I really hit the parent jackpot, if you will. I literally became the perfect combination of an educator of nonprofit and social impact issues. One of my other stories is that I'm a dad. That's a really important uh, role that I play, one of my stories. And I bet a lot of you are parents on the line as well. So this is my daughter, Penelope. But actually, stories and daughters, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, I am a dad, and my daughter is Penelope, but this is not actually Penelope. This is Penelope. So Penelope is obviously a cat, but more accurately, she's a hairless cat which is not to be confused with a skinless cat. I have a couple of friends who always say, how is your skinless cat? And I have to say, skinless cat, she's completely skin. Uh, but what's interesting is they do have a little bit of fur. It feels like a warm peach to the touch or a piece of velvet, but that they have that traditional sandpaper-like tongue that all cats have. And she sleeps under the covers with me. Take a look at that image. So I want you to imagine for a moment that warm peach to the touch under the covers with you, but that sandpaper like tongue going on at the same time. It's like heaven and hell going on at once. But that's a, one of my stories. And Penelope sort of was on the cover of magazine, not quite. This was a National Geographic uh, cover from October, and we were really excited to get it in the mail. It really does exist. I didn't make this up, by the way. Minds of their own. They definitely do. Um, but it was totally Penelope's spitting image. So that's a little bit of my stories. I could keep going on and on. I could tell you stories about how I'm from Chicago, and that's my beloved hometown, even though I've lived and worked in Washington, D.C. for many years. I could tell you other stories about how I, too, am an alum of Georgetown University, or how I had the most amazing of experiences working for Dr. Jane Goodall, the world's foremost authority on chimpanzees. But we really are fundamentally kind of composed of stories. We are also, though, frame stories that we share, both pers personally and professionally, as well as consciously and really subconsciously, that really a good way to think about the stories that we're composed of and maybe that we communicate is also through the lens of framing. So think about our little Zoom boxes that uh, we are still in to this day. But if you changed the frame what would the story, how would the story change? So if I moved my frame, if I moved it even more, you would see my closet. And if I opened it up, you would see my house is not as uh, organized as it might seem, that, that all this crap would come out of the closet. So there are so many stories in the world. There are so many frames to stories in the world as well. As I mentioned that we are storytelling creatures and there's theories that actually back this up. So there's Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm theory that we should really think about, which is in contrast to the rational world paradigm. So the rational world paradigm really says that humans are rational beings, that we go about through the world and we make decisions based upon arguments that are rooted in kind of traditional logic. But what the narrative paradigm theory says is that humans are storytellers. Again, that we may not be eloquent storytellers, all of us, going up and doing public presentations, but that doesn't matter, is that we're looking for good reasons based upon stories as we go about our life experiences. So kind of something to think about. Are you more attentive to the rational world paradigm, or do you see that rationality can really be also understood through the perspective of stories? So there's so many different purposes of stories and storytelling, and especially so as we think about the work of social impact. At the work of the Center for Social Impact Communication, we really have a wide umbrella as to what social impact work actually entails. Absolutely nonprofits, but also socially responsible businesses, uh, government, the, the other sector, um, really thinking about associations, social movements, so on and so forth. There's so many different organizations 
and even not traditional organizations that play a role within social impact. And so what that means as it relates to the purpose of stories and storytelling is that stories and storytelling are about influence making, is we can use stories to raise funds, to deepen human relationships, uh, to be thinking about helping understand somebody else understand really complex social issues that might be facing particular communities. The list is really endless, but I'd like to argue that one of the through lines as we think about the purpose of stories and storytelling is that they are this currency of human life, that we can't get through a single day without telling or consuming stories, but really is that they help us to create and share meaning together. I don't have to tell any of you that we live in a complex world in complex times, as humans, we try to make meaning of the complexity of around us. And often we turn to stories to do exactly that, whether we realize it or not. So a wonderful example of this is gossip. Gossip is actually a form of storytelling. So do we all know those emails that go in through organizations where it's the subject line, so-and-so is leaving the organization, please wish them well. And then you're really going through closed doors in the office or on Zoom, and you're saying, why is that person actually leaving? What's the story behind that? So that's the idea of really making meaning. As we apply that in different settings to obviously bigger social impact topics, we're really trying to understand them. What does food insecurity actually mean? What does it look like? How can we think about interventions to solve it? Stories are a really key way in which we can have that emotion come to life and share meaning about those really complex topics. So as we create stories, I'm a really firm believer is we always have to really determine what is the purpose, that the bar is higher, if you will, as we think about storytelling, not just in general, but really again, applied to social impact in particular. What is that purpose of the story that we're trying to communicate? Let's go through a little bit of the history of storytelling because it's a rich one. Uh, I break it down by six key milestones, and there's a lot of other ones, you know, the way I present it, it's, it seems a little bit static, but it's not in actuality. Um, the first milestone I would argue of storytelling to showcase its evolution is visual storytelling, is before we as humans were able to verbally communicate, is we were telling stories in visual means. Of course, we still do that to this day, but think about cave paintings. The example that you see on screen is from Sri Lanka and the Sigiraya or the Lion Rock. I visited Sri Lanka a number of years ago and I wanted to go see the Lion Rocks. So you climb all, almost all the way up to the top and you see these magnificent cave paintings where yes, they're art, but we can also conceptualize them as forms of stories, as characters, as emotions. Then the next milestone is verbal storytelling linked to every culture, every indigenous group uh, throughout time and throughout so many geographies across the world. This is really the first form of history and the first form of education, passing down stories from the past to the present in hopes that they survive to the future. And there's so many cities uh, throughout, especially the United States that are really having a renaissance with verbal storytelling. In Washington DC, we have something called the Story District where it really is spoken word. But again, it's linked to so many indigenous wisdom as we think about that power of the human voice and really being able to get out nuance. And again, that history and education from the past to the present to the future. Stories are time travelers. The next milestone is printed storytelling. And one of the classic examples of this where we put our verbal stories into printed format was Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey. And around this time, probably even though before Homer's Iliad and The Odyssey was Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher. And what he had to say is that there were three modes of persuasion or influence, and that each one of these legs of the stool had to be present if you were able to persuade or influence somebody. And think about these today. It really still holds a lot of weight. He said that there had to be ethos, is that there had to be credibility of the communicator or the form of communication, but also logos or logic and rationality. 
But then he also said, don't forget about pathos, the emotion, right? The imagination within that communication. And that's especially where stories live, that a central ingredient in a really good story is some form of emotion, not necessarily tugging at your heartstrings, but some form of emotion. But also stories can live in each of these other components as well. You can tell a story that backs up, for example, credibility. So really, again, thinking about the evolution of storytelling. Milestone four is multi-channel storytelling. This is when we had more opportunities, more channels, more mediums as humans to communicate. So an infamous example that I always love to reference is uh, the War of the Worlds, that really now classic infamous example where a lot of people didn't hear the beginning of the broadcast and so they didn't know it was fiction. And it was about an alien invasion from Mars. And so they didn't hear the beginning of the broadcast and they thought it was really happening. And so there are documented cases of people going to police and fire stations and saying, how can I help? And it also created in Washington, D.C., the most uh, fantastic, or at least the most infamous form of action, a congressional investigation. So just this idea that we had more forms and ability to communicate. Then milestone five of six is branded storytelling. This is where the marketers and salespeople among us really started to understand, my goodness, we could take this ancient form of influence stories and we can think about utilizing them in different ways really to sell products. So the example you see on screen is from the John Deere Tractor Company, which has published for over 150 years, the Furrow Magazine. And I purchased a couple of issues uh, on eBay. Uh, and what's interesting when I got them and flipped through them, they were all doing the so-called soft sell. Yes, they wanted to sell those John Deere tractor products, but really how they were doing it was not an explicit ask, but rather storytelling of farmers and the communities and really establishing that human connection. And then lastly, the milestone that we're in right now that we really need to critically think about as storytellers for social impact is what I call semi-democratized storytelling. So this is a good news, bad news sort of scenario. The good news is all of us can and are storytellers with the little technological devices that most of us have. That's the good news, but guess what? That's also the bad news. And as we break it down, you know, arguably the good news is that more voices are able to be heard than ever before. Is there's not as many traditional gatekeepers, uh, for example, to get those stories out. Is that we don't have to go as much to traditional news media outlets to have those stories be told. The gates have been crashed, some like to say. But the bad news is that there aren't those gatekeepers, right? Is that really fake news, of course, is a really big consideration um, that we need to think about. What is the truth and validity of these stories? Again, that, that narrative paradigm, we have to pick the truth and validity of stories that are all around us. But it also, I think, is really a hopeful opportunity, in my mind, as we think about social impact and social justice, is we have the ability now with our work in our organizations to not only be the storyteller, that's one way, but to be story conveners of other voices and story amplifiers, perhaps, of stories that need to be out there that maybe are not traditionally out there in current or in the past. So that brings me to the current state of storytelling. Where are we now? Really, what do we need to think about so that we can do storytelling even better? I've got three headlines for you to consider. One is that storytelling is a really hot topic and for good reason. It's a hot topic. I have to say our certificate in social impact storytelling, it's a really popular program. We get the most interesting of people including some who are on this line who you might imagine. I'll never forget, I had one student who was literally taking the program, because it's an online program, uh, on the Serengeti and doing work in conservation while on the Serengeti. Uh, but there's also numbers to back this up that storytelling is a hot topic. Topic. If you do a Google search result, you'll get over 180 million results on storytelling. There's just so much that's out there. This next one is interesting. We did a study here at Georgetown of nonprofit job postings in a three-year time span. And what we saw in that sample is that there was a huge increase by 164% 
of nonprofit employers looking for candidates with storytelling skills, or what we deem to be the equivalent, even if they didn't use that word story. And then lastly, some sources are citing storytelling as the number one business skill of the next five years. So not even just, you know, traditional communication or marketing, but all a business skill. And I think that's really because all of us, no matter our particular job titles, is we're all in the influence business, especially as it relates to social impact, is we're trying to influence people. And storytelling is a really great tool in the toolbox to do exactly that. The good reason portion is because stories activate our brains in really interesting ways. Facts, figures, statistics, really important. It's not in either or, it's not data or stories. To me, it's data and stories. But stories have unusual superpowers as it relates to the brain. One in particular is cortex activity. So just more parts of our brain are activated when we're consuming a really interesting, well-constructed story. Second is dopamine. Dopamine is released into our systems uh, when we consume a good story. And so that's often why we remember stories versus facts and figures. Next is neural coupling. A good story is relatable. It simultaneously, and sounds like a dichotomy, it makes this space as we could be different than somebody else, uh, but we also can find commonality as we think about the connections in the story. And so that's the idea of neural coupling at work as we find relatability through a story and somebody's experience. And then lastly is mirroring, is that we actually have similar brain activity to not only the person communicating a story, but to a fellow listener. So again, as we think about social impact and the power of communication, we want to make connections that drive change. So the idea of mirroring that similar brain activity is really, really a good thing to think about as well. But the plus side of all of this is also some of the negative side is we have because of some of this brain science, we've fallen into some really bad traps with storytelling for impact. I want to share with you this next study. This was not done by us at Georgetown. But what these researchers were looking at was for UNICEF, and they were testing different story examples, which story was going to result in the most donation. So story one, in a nutshell, talked about Rokia, a real young girl in the country of Mali. She's a good student. Um, she helps her family. Will you make a donation? It will help Rokia and her family. That was story one, in a nutshell. The second story also talked about Rokia but didn't give as many relatable details. It gave a lot more facts, figures, statistics about the issue of hunger in the country of Mali. And then the third story example didn't even feature Rokia at all. It talked about hunger on the continent of Africa, not even within the country of Mali. So the example is they tested these different stories. It was story one that resulted in the most donations. And this is what they called the identifiable victim effect. So there's takeaways, good and bad, as we think about really being more ethical and social justice oriented impact storytellers. As we think about this, I think one of the takeaways is we do need to focus our stories, especially shorter ones. You know, one main character can be effective is that our brains follow another human story most effectively. But can you also see all the, the downside of this? is this is really perpetuating negative stereotypes, bias even. So as we think about these really complex social issues that we're involved in, how do you tell maybe these more complex, sophisticated narratives? Move the needle, thinking about different forms of success for individual stories uh, and having asset-based stories instead of this victim-based sort of narrative uh, that's happening right here. This is happening a lot, though. Uh, this is another, this is a Facebook post from the International Rescue Committee, and you can read what it's all about. And it's not a negative story, but you have to ask yourself the question, look at the engagement that I, it got. You know, is this really what we're trying to do? Is this the narrative in this case as we're thinking about refugee issues? Um, and this particular young girl from Syria, you know, how do we move the issue? How do we think about using stories to really evolve narratives in different sort of ways? 
The second headline, though, is, is stories really have been proven to drive action. This is another study that we did at Georgetown Center for Social Impact Communication, is that stories really have the ability to take an online engagement and move it to an offline action. But the third headline to consider is, what the heck is a story? Is there's no central definition in the academic literature of what exactly is a story. It's kind of this epic debate. You know, we often hear things like a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Some people agree with that, some don't. So I really am an advocate as you think about your own settings. You know, what is the definition, or, or at least what is the conceptualization of a story as you think about your particular setting. And as you do, let me give you some other thoughts that might be helpful. You know, this is one conceptualization that sometimes I think about with impact-based storytelling, is that a story creates emotion and it drives some sort of action from your target audiences, but it also takes an investment, certainly in time, sometimes resources, to create and share. So in other words, what this is getting across is the bar is higher for an impact-based story, is we want somebody not only to feel, but hopefully to take some sort of action, even if it's a light action as part of that process. This is different, but interrelated to content. Content shares information, but not necessarily in an emotional, targeted, and action-driven way. So both of these are needed within all organizations, including impact-based organizations. And what this is also saying, stick with me, is that all stories are content, but not all content are stories. So what I'm really seeing a lot of in our social impact space is a lot of things being called stories, when in actuality, maybe they're just forms of information. And maybe it doesn't matter, but I think it does when you start to really think about doing this work more purposefully, um, doing it more ethically as well. So some things to consider there too. What's more is that there's a lot of different types of stories, and there's two basic ones that I want you to think about. There's informal stories. So these are stories that are really dialogue based. You know, they're not perfectly created. They're often ad hoc. But they're also really important. They carry a lot of meaning and they also help build trust. So this is when you're talking to a friend or a colleague, right? The so-called water cooler talk where you're not planning that story, but it's a really important story to communicate because you're making meaning again in these complex environments that we're always within. But then we also have formal stories. These are created ahead of time when maybe the stakes are a little bit higher, you're really trying to reach a key audience or a stakeholder, and they really do require a true investment of time and effort. So both of these two are needed, and we have kind of an ecosystem of stories. And do you see how there's benefits of both of these? Informal stories are so trustworthy, right? And they're not planned, but the formal stories are really more strategic as we're trying to move the needle. So perhaps kind of the name of the game and a lot of what we're teaching in the Certificate in Social Impact Storytelling is how do you bring the best of both of those worlds together? So part of that is thinking about a story framework. There's so many different story frameworks that are out there. I'm going to give you just the one that we've created at Georgetown and just highlight some of the specifics on it really, really quickly. Um, this has six building blocks in particular. The first building block is a character. So we as humans, we connect right with other people. So you really need to think about who is that compelling main character who is relatable to your target audience, and then bringing them to life in the story, hopefully by communicating directly and sharing details, but maybe thinking about a number, uh, one or two supporting characters. So the takeaway with this is you really wanna keep the number of characters to a minimum, and the organization is not a character. So we've all seen those kind of organizational overview videos. Those have its place, but those are not characters because you really can't connect, right, with an organization. We connect with people and the organization has a halo effect instead. The second building block is trajectory. This is the idea that in a really effective story, something happens, sounds kind of obvious, right? but it's about a journey, a transformation, a discovery. So this is really the plot, but the plot can kind of be twisted and be really uh, creative. So it doesn't have to start 
at how something really happened in real life. So you can utilize flashbacks, flash forwards, whatever format the story might be, written, verbal, video, you know, whatever the case may be. So you wanna vary the pace of a story, get somebody's interest. The third building block is authenticity. The, the word I actually use, like to use now more than authenticity is genuineness. Because I think we have all this talk now, we have all these like Harvard Business Review articles, 10 ways to be authentic. Well, if you're trying to be too strategic about being authentic, you're really not being authentic. But what we want our storytelling to be is being uh, genuine. So we do that by utilizing everyday language, right? Tell the story from that character's own point of view and engage the senses. If we're fully abled individuals, there's five, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. So whatever the story is, not just saying I'm having a cup of coffee, but a, in my case, a stale old Keurig that I've had, you know, since uh, nine o'clock this morning and really get those senses going in a little bit uh, more creative sort of way. Uh, four of six is action-oriented emotions. And so that's a central ingredient. And I always like to think about storytelling more as cooking versus baking. Baking, right, you've got to have the exact ingredients and the exact amounts. Cooking, you've got to have the cores, but you get to be creative. Same thing with storytelling, but we have to have emotions. So we really need to think about what sort of emotions do we want to get across in that story? You know, take a look at what's on screen. These are just a small sampling of human emotions because we're complex. So instead of, you know, maybe wanting somebody to feel angry, maybe what's more accurate is you want them to feel frustrated or irritated. You know, you get the idea is get that granularity within the story as we can form our stories in different sort of ways. I also love this visual. Same sort of idea. You have core emotions in the middle and then it gets more nuanced as the emotion wheel goes. So as you really plan social impact stories, you want to think about taking them on an emotional journey, not just happy or sad, but thinking, where do you want to start? Where do you want to take them next? And how do you really want uh, to leave them? Some stories have calls to action, but not every story needs a call to action. So this is based upon research, again, we've done at the university with nonprofit stories. And so a common one is to donate. But you really need to think about who's your target audience and what makes sense. You know, sometimes a story has that specific call to action. Other times it really is just more about relationship building and thinking if it's a verbal story, more about the nonverbals that you want to get in return. So really, again, just thinking purposefully about, you know, what do we want to get across in that story? Five of six, stick with me, we're almost done here, is a hook. If you, you've got to capture somebody's attention. You literally have five to 10 seconds in most stories. So think about what, how do you begin that story? Is it a shocking statistic? Is it a photo? Is it something that's humorous? You know, there's so many ways to capture somebody's attention, really thinking purposefully again about that. And then the last building block, and this is terribly important, is the storyteller. As we think about a lens of social justice, uh, who is that storyteller? Because arguably a story is somebody's personal truth. So as much as possible, we want a story told by the person who owns it. Because number one, they're the best storyteller because it's their experience, but also that's the equitable thing to do. So really, as you think about maybe supporters of social impact, making sure that they understand they have a story to tell and that there's value in that story and creating really that comfortable environment and asking permission if it's going to be shared elsewhere, that they really understand where that story is going to be shared. That's a key one. So as we think about kind of this current state of storytelling, let's go to the future. Uh, and then we're, I'm going to end and then I hope that we have some more questions that are out there that we can talk through is there's so many rich examples of how storytelling for social impact is evolving. So many different ways to think about conceptualizing stories. You know, this framework is great that I just shared. I think that's important. But there's also times as we're trying to advance impact when we know the frameworks and then maybe we've got to throw them out the window. 
we've got to think about sharing stories more creatively in different sort of conceptual ways. So let me just share with you a couple of interesting examples that I've been tracking uh, that might kind of inspire you in different ways to think differently about stories. One is a symbolic character. So remember, that's in the framework, a character, is we have to think about you know, getting across that, that human character. But what if we had a different conceptualization of character to get somebody's attention, to have them engage with the issue, with the story at hand? Let me give you two examples that brings this to life. Um, I had a former boss, Jane Goodall. This was before I've been at Georgetown a long time, but this was one of my prior lives, one of my prior stories, was working for this amazing uh, woman who's the best storyteller of them all. And what Jane does is she's on a perpetual world speaking tour. She travels 300 days a year nonstop, but she travels around the world with a stuffed monkey who you see in that photo named Mr. H. And he has a whole story himself. He was given to her by a friend, a blind magician, and he didn't realize it was a monkey with a tail instead of a chimpanzee without a tail. But he said, no matter, take him wherever you go and my spirit will be with you. And so that's exactly what she does. And he's really a mascot. And so Jane has taken him to like 100 plus countries. He's been touched by millions of people. He goes through the dishwasher a couple of times a year. But Jane uses him as a story so strategically. Going to Capitol Hill to lawmakers, she doesn't start with talking about her issues in the environment. She talks literally about introducing Mr. H. And so that connection, that human connection starts to build through the lens of a story. But a really great other use of Mr. H is when Jane goes through the airports and goes through you know, security and passport control and all that. And what Jane does is puts Mr. H up there and hands over her passport and then hands over a two inch by three inch passport that a fan made for Mr. H. And all of a sudden their eyes light up and then she goes in for the kill. She hands over a donation bro or membership brochure from the Jane Goodall Institute. And she has a great return rate. She tells the story of Mr. H and she does that call to action. So again, just really thinking creatively about the conceptualization of a character. Here's one other example for you. I want you to meet Sel Manila from the state of Oregon. I learned about him a few years ago when I had a reporter from Oregon call me up and said, do you know what the Department of Health is doing? And I said, no. And what I found out is they had Salmonella tweeting in the first person. And you can take a look at what some of the tweets were. But it was just this conceptualization, very snarky, you know, again, thinking about character in a different way. And then they interviewed me for this traditional newspaper article. And I had to say, this was really creative. This was a really great way to capture people's attention. So again, just this different way in which we can take stories. Let me give you one or two examples of other future change spaces. Another one that I love is story experiences. How can we think about stories not just as manifestations on websites, but make them more dynamic, make them in real time? So one of the examples that I love is called the Human Library. This is now all over the world, but it started in uh, Europe. And what it's the idea of the human library is don't judge a book by its cover. And so you curate an event where some people who are human books, where they tell their story, and some people who are human readers that listen and engage with the book. So it sounds kind of silly to begin with, but is absolutely just a way to break down barriers and stereotypes. So I did this with some of my students before COVID, kind of as an experiment. And so I had students who were really wanting to take on, they wanted to be the human books. So one of my students, you know, without any prompting, wanted to talk about her story about being an immigrant uh, in the United States. Another student uh, talked about alcoholism and the ups and downs that went on uh, with really that really complex medical issue as well. And so we curated, we had over 50 people on Georgetown's campus, and these are some of the things that they said that it was in lib enlightening, liberating, thought-provoking. One person said, I felt connected to a stranger I didn't even know. Through a sense of community and empathetic understanding, the human library helped me to wake up to an issue I didn't even realize I was asleep for. So again, the takeaway I think is just think about how do we curate experiences in different sort of ways? 
And another example of how to utilize this idea is what if we did a human library on Zoom? So if the idea is don't judge a book by its cover, imagine having the Zoom cameras off at first and just listening to the stories, whether that be colleagues, you know, or other people that you don't interact with about social issues, and then actually seeing those faces. It really curates this different way of thinking and feeling, and therefore hopefully dialogue about those respective issues. And there's so many other ways to take story experiences. This last example here comes from my uh, hometown of Chicago. This is the Folded Map Project, and it's address pairs and map twins. So unfortunately, sh Chicago, like a lot of urban areas, has a lot of modern day segregation. So what this really creative storyteller was doing with this project is she wanted to pair people on the south side of Chicago and the north side of Chicago who had the exact same address and then sit down and tell stories about what their life experiences were. And really the takeaway from this is they had more in common than they had differences. So again, it embrace this dichotomy. We might be different in all the ways we can be different as humans, but through this lens of story is we can also find the commonalities really, really powerful. Here's the last one that I want to give you, and then we'll open it up, is a new story paradigm. I'm a really big believer in all the work that we're doing in social impact storytelling at Georgetown, that it's not enough anymore to create more stories in the world. The ends do not necessarily justify the means. Is It's not just about that final product, if you will, of the story. It's also now about the process that we really have to think ethically uh, about what is that process. And so we do see a lot in the social impact space of organizations taking ownership of people's stories is trying to have really good, important missions, but not thinking uh, ethically about that process. But there's a lot of hope is because I also see a lot of organizations thinking about uh, that process and thinking about things like storytelling codes of ethics. So this is an amazing organization called Nuru International. They do a lot of work with farmers in Africa. And so what they created was a storytelling code of ethics of thinking about affirming human dignity and agency, acknowledging power, you know, in the relationships, do no harm as they're soliciting stories. So as we think about the past, the present, and the future, there's so many links as we go to storytelling for social impact, to really think about these more ethical ways in which to do it. But fundamentally, what it's going to take is story leaders, is that all of us in organizations, no matter our roles, is that we have a really key role to play, not just as the storytellers, but as the story conveners and the story amplifiers, and to think about getting other people involved in the process. So that's work that I'm so proud to share with you today, some initial ideas. I hope it sparked some food for thought for all of you. Um, but I'd love to open it up now. Love to open it up with any ideas that it sparked, any questions that are on your mind. And as we do, just to remind you, we've got those four different social impact programs uh, at Georgetown that we'd love to have you be a part of if they are of interest to you. So with that said, I'll pause. And Jeff, if we could open it up, that would be great. Well, thank you very much, John. Can you hear me? I can. Great. I wish I, uh, we, uh, Helga would like to say thank you so much. The information you provided to her and the audience today has been so useful. Uh, she wanted to know if the uh, slides or additional information will be available from you after this presentation. I, I think, Jeff, am I remembering that we shared this recording on YouTube? Yes. Uh, this, this recording will be edited and closed captioned and will be posted to YouTube within two days. Excellent. Uh, another great uh, question from Daniel. What was the change space number three? Yes, I did skip, skip over that just for the sake of time so we could open it up a little bit more. Um, but change space three was citizen storytellers. So really thinking about other 
folks who are out there related to social impact work and thinking about their currency um, to share stories and not just donations. So really expanding the lens of what is philanthropy um, and not just monetarily, but also thinking about that from the lens of stories. So I always got get the idea from citizen science. You know, citizen science is about extending the reach of formal scientists doing bird counts or thinking about different ways to get scientific knowledge. What if we applied the same sort of idea to storytelling and thought about our storytellers and our volunteers as citizen storytellers? So really curating their voice uh, and their points of view as a really great way in which to extend the mission of the work that we're up to. Excellent. I have a question, if I may, John. Yeah, Please. when I was a little boy, my grandmother was a great storyteller, and I always wanted to be a good storyteller, and I just don't think I've made it yet. How can we practice? How can we use the building blocks and some of the things that you've given us today to become better storytellers? I think it, it is one of these things, the more practice you do, you know, the more comfortable that you get, and you've got to go start somewhere. But one of my real big tricks that I really love, Jeff, is if you don't feel as if you're a natural storyteller, especially verbally, is use old fashioned show and tell items. So, you know, what are physical items? A cover of National Geographic with a hairless cat. That was my, one of my examples, right? Or here's, we talked about Mr. H, here's Mr. H Jr. Um, a thank you note maybe from a supporter within your organization. If you're trying to tell a story, use a physical item. It can seem like a little bit of a crutch, but it also can be this way, again, to communicate the meaning of a story in a much more tangible way. I think that's an important thing to kind of practice is kind of incorporate physical items and practice with verbal storytelling and pay attention to the nonverbals. So even if you adhere to the building blocks that I shared, think about how is somebody responding as you talk in real time and pivot the story accordingly. That's another good one. And then the last tip I'll give, don't start with saying, I'd love to tell you a story. Just go into it because you know, Jeff, what happens when you tell somebody, can I tell you a story? Is they get really excited and the bar gets really high. Because when we say, can I tell you a story? The other person is expecting that better be a damn good story. And if it's not, they're really disappointed. So uh, a good rule of thumb is don't say, may I tell you a story? Just go right into it um, and think about those other tips as well. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Here's really a great question. I'm an early stage entrepreneur, crowdfunding for my residential, uh, residential hospitality startup venture. What you what is unique about storytelling for fundraising, John? I think all of the principles that we talked about apply. You know, what's really with fundraising purposes is there probably is an ask at the end, is you're trying to move people up the ladder of engagement somehow. So of course the ask might be to make that donation, right? Or to contribute to that funding if it's related to social entrepreneurship, or it might be an ask to continue the engagement. So, you know, the difference about the storytelling is, again, there's probably some sort of ask. What's more is I think that the bar is a little bit higher, I would argue, with the ethical approach to storytelling with fundraising. So we've got to make sure we're not doing that identifiable victim effect, is we're not taking control of somebody else's story, not a rags to riches deficit based sort of story. So we've got to think very purposeful about that. You know, a lot of people think with fundraising stories is you have to show that trajectory and why that donation makes a difference. Um, you do, but we also have to make sure we don't get back into this bias based sort of storytelling. Um, so those are some of the things to really be on the lookout for. I'm also a big advocate of looking at what, what might be um, kind of frenemies or competitors. You know, in the social impact space, we're all trying to do good work. So I hate to say it's competition in the traditional sense, but whatever your organization might be, including for fundraising purposes, take a look at those stories that those frenemies and competitors 
are communicating because probably those supporters are hearing similar types of stories time and time again. So the takeaway, in other words, is you want to do different types of storytelling than those frenemies and competitors. Excellent. Thank you. Richard has a great question. You got his interest about what's happening in Washington. Can you expand a bit on the storytelling community that's been created in D.C.? Storytelling in D.C. is really rich because won't surprise a lot of people, you know, on on this meeting. There's a lot of social impact work in Washington, D.C. Yes, it, it's government, but also arguably it's a huge, rich ecosystem of social impact. So there's kind of that angle. And, you know, this program that we have at Georgetown, why we created it, the Certificate in Social Impact Storytelling, is we didn't see any other university approaching the topic in depth and research-based, but also applied. And so, you know, I'm really proud that we've had now, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but probably, Jeff, I think it's close to maybe 200 alums of the program. So we kind of have a community of practice of social impact storytelling. But as I was talking about earlier, there's also a rich ecosystem just of storytelling with spoken word. Um, Story District is another organization doing this that's not trying to necessarily do impact-based storytelling, but just embracing the human aspect of storytelling. But you also have that in other cities. Um, you also have NPR StoryCorps, which has this wonderful mobile van that travels the country. Often it's also at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And it's, it's two people who know each other, who love each other. They sit down and they communicate in stories, again, finding that commonality. So you just see all of these interesting, innovative ways once you start opening kind of your eyes and ears to them. So always my takeaway is, is how can we take these ideas and how can we apply it to our work in social impact? Another key interesting trend line it's not in DC, but it's in other cities, just as an asterisk here, uh, especially in the United States, is we have a lot of chief storytellers. So the first chief storyteller in the United States was in Detroit, Michigan. He was named the chief storyteller by the mayor in a bar. So the best and worst decisions always happen in bars. I think this was a good decision. But he was the chief storyteller. So part of his job really was not just to share stories about Detroit, but to get other people involved and to evolve the narrative. You know, the traditional narrative about Detroit as Motor City, you know, maybe decline, but rather his task was thinking about who are the other voices to evolve that narrative to one of innovation, young people coming into the city. We now see chief storytellers in Denver. Um, in There's one in Florida. There's a chief storyteller at Microsoft Corporation, at United Airlines. So this is kind of a trend line that we're seeing in cities, as well as organizations that I think are a lot of takeaways for us to consider in the social impact space too. John, I know a lot of people would like to uh, make contact with you later. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, if you look at the slide, uh, Dr. Tribus has been kind enough to uh, give his Georgetown email address. Plus he has also given the web address for the Center for Social Impact Communications. I've also included in the uh, chat, the link to the uh, YouTube channel where this video will be posted in two days. John, we're getting very, very close uh, to the end of the hour. Uh, maybe one more question here, if I may. How sure. do you find the right venues for your stories in a crowded and ever evolving media space? Mm, it's a really good question. I think it fundamentally goes back to who are you trying to reach with the stories? Um, really thinking about before you actually share those stories, even create the stories or think about who should be sharing those stories. You know, again, my argument is the bar is higher for social impact storytelling because of these ethical considerations and because the premise of the question, this is a crowded space. We're not only competing, if you will, with the frenemies competitors, but with just so much information and other stories that are out there. So fundamentally, I think that in order to know what spaces, mediums, or channels, you've got to go back to who do you want to reach, and then to really think about where is the best way to reach them. Is it social media? Is it on the website? You know, is it face-to-face? -face? 
So that's how you answer that question. It's a lot of kind of critical thinking. But I would say is I am a huge advocate of as much as possible, even with all these channels and mediums that we have, social media and otherwise, I think there's real lost opportunity in face-to-face, old-fashioned sort of let's look somebody in the eye, let's communicate as human beings. There's just a lot of research, especially with social impact issues, that that's what moves the needle. You know, one example of this is one of the newer initiatives of NPR StoryCorps is One Small Step. There was this wonderful, I encourage you to check it out, wonderful 60 Minutes piece on it a few uh, months ago. But the premise of this was two people who are on opposite sides of the political aisle, right? State of the Union is tonight, so this is top of mind. But two people who are on opposite sides of the aisle, they sit down and they don't talk politics. They just share stories about who they are in other aspects of life. And so they're doing a lot of research with this that they find those commonalities and they understand there is usually more of what's alike with us as humans than what's different. So as we think about kind of that mix and who we want to reach, how do we break out the clutter and bring a little bit more of the humanity of more of that face-to-face and verbal uh, storytelling? I think that's really important. And that brings us to the close of our hour. Dr. Tribus, thank you so much for presenting. I'd like to extend a, a thank you to all the participants today. Thank you for taking your lunch hour to be with us here at Knowledge at Noon, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.